welcome to the UNESCO listed Grand Place in Brussels. Now our team is in this city a lot to report on the European institutions, but in this programme we're going to be expanding our Belgian horizons. This is a country of 11 million people who speak three different official languages, Dutch, French and German. As you might imagine, governance is rather complex. It is a patchwork state at the heart of the patchwork, which is Europe. Well, later this spring, Belgium is going to be election central, with local, national and European elections all taking place on the same Super Sunday at the end of May. Will the Green parties be able to take advantage of a so-called green wave that's been sweeping across Europe? And could there be another long wait to form a Belgian government? In the show, we're also going to be taking a look at some hot stories from Belgium's neighbours, the Netherlands and Luxembourg, the trio that together form Benelux. First, though, let's go and meet an MEP who is Bruxellois through and through. And to meet our guest, we've come to this rather lovely garden in Anderlecht, a borough of Brussels, to meet uh, Philippe Lambert. Hello there. Hello. And uh, you are the co-head of the Greens Group in the European Parliament. As we know, you're standing for the Ecolo Party here in Belgium as yep. well. I just wanted to start off by uh, telling our viewers, in fact, this is a house where Erasmus, the famous Renaissance philosopher, once lived, famously known as a traveller and a philosopher. What do you think he would have made of Belgium today, this country that's seen as rather complicated, but very much at the heart of matters in Europe? Well, I think that he would have been confused on the one hand, because indeed this is a bit of an artificial country, but it it would have been, he would have felt at home here because, well, he felt at home almost every place. Many different cultures co uh, cohabitating here and, uh, well, sometimes having some trouble working together. But at the end of the day, we try to live a, a good life in Brussels and that's what unites us as Belgians. We're looking at the elections that are coming up. Uh, there have been some rather burning matters here in Belgium recently. There have been gilets jaunes protests, like yeah. in France. There are a lot of people worried about jihadists coming back to Belgium from the Middle East. Uh, there are all sorts of issues that traditional parties seem to be having trouble getting to grips with. A prediction around Europe that populists are going to benefit from this. Do you agree? Well, they are winning in the Flanders, quite obviously. I mean, uh, the combination of uh, the far-right uh, Flams Belang and the very nationalist neoliberal uh, uh, NVA uh, is clearly a sign that uh, populism is winning, not so much uh, in the French-speaking part of the country. And I'm not sure that uh, the populists will make any additional inroads. So they have a strong position in, in, in the Flanders. I do not believe that they will really gain leverage. They might even lose some. And uh, uh, we'll see, but I think that the adults in the room will, uh, will find a ways to govern this country. I take it you see your party, Ecolo, as one of the adults in the room? Absolutely. We'll talk about your policies a bit more in just a minute. But it does have to be said that here in Belgium and elsewhere in Europe, there has been a growth in support for green political parties. Our reporter, Anaïs Guerra, tells us more. A high-profile reception for these high school Thank students you. at the European Commission. I'm we are still striking because we have done our homework. Greta Thunberg has mobilised young people around the world. In Belgium, thousands of school students have protested in the streets. Adelaide has been organising demos in the French-speaking half of the country. Their goal, demand that politicians make the climate a national priority. We're scared. We want to know what to expect for the future. We want a change, a change of system, so that we can keep our planet. To make sure her voice is heard, Adelaide is boycotting school every Thursday until the European elections. The young generation's determination is a cause for celebration for Delphine Misson, an environmental law professor. You can really feel the energy from the street. The young people are calling for a change of mindset for society, which is dominated by producing and consuming. Young people are very conscious of the problem, and maybe they understand the problem better than adults. The students' enthusiasm is contagious. Delphine and a dozen colleagues have proposed a climate law for Belgium to streamline national legislation. It doesn't work well in Belgium. We aren't able to decide promptly together how to act faced with climate change. 
The environment, though, is a victim of Belgium's political realities. It falls under the authority of four different ministries. For these experts, that fragmentation is an obstacle to finding a universal solution. The trains are run by the federal state, but the other public transport, trams and buses, are regional issues. Every department has to take responsibility to make the necessary investments to achieve a shared objective. The proposed changes to the constitution had the backing of the country's environmental parties, but they were rejected by parliament. The mass demonstrations, though, have energised Belgium's Green Party. Their leaders coming to Paris to meet with 600 prominent European environmentalists to propose radical changes, such as the creation of a European climate bank. There is a way to finance the energy transition in such a way that it doesn't weigh on families and other people, just like there was a way to finance the banking crisis. The ambitions for the bank are substantial. European funds, as well as a tax on business, to raise 300 billion euros a year. The environment is set to change the political landscape in Belgium. The protests have propulsed the country's Greens into first place in polls ahead of federal elections in May. Well, Philippe Lombards, we saw in our report just there, lots of uh, young people in particular being very enthusiastic about uh, green concerns. Here in Belgium, it does look like that's going to translate into some quite uh, strong gains for the green parties. Yours, Ecolo, could come out in first place in Brussels, at least. Uh, what do you think is driving this? Well, uh, an increased sense of urgency, I think, about the uh, environmental emergency and the social emergency. And I think that increasingly people recognize uh, the Greens as providing credible answers to, uh, to these two uh, emergencies. So we are taking nothing for granted. We are working hard to gain the trust of our, of our fellow citizens. But apparently, well, we are get, getting traction in society. Just in terms of uh, climate and environmental policies, they are perhaps anecdotally very popular, but when it comes down to actually making new laws and policies, they're often seen as being detrimental to the economy or involving higher taxes for the citizens at large. I just had lunch with the, the boss of the Federation of uh, Walloon Businesses, and actually he also believes, like us, that making Belgium a pioneer of the transition is actually means economic opportunity. That is, well, either we defend the vested interest of the laggards, or we want to invest to become world leaders and then have solutions to sell. You know, uh, Belgium could be a museum for the rest of the world, but we want to do more to the rest of the world than just being a good place to visit. But when it comes to other areas of governance, uh, people do, I think, wonder whether the Green parties have solid enough ideas. Can you convince voters on other scores? Look at me. I, I mean, I worked 22 years in a big multinational. How many politicians of the so-called traditional parties can claim that they have experience of, real, of, of the real business life? I mean, they are few and far between. So, you know, uh, sometimes people ask me, well, because you are competent on financial and economic matters, why are you with the Greens? And that confirms this, this sort of cliche. That, uh, that we are incompetent in these matters. But I think that increasingly people recognize that mainstream economic thinking is actually driving your societies into a very thick wall and that you need new ideas. So there's more opening to new ideas, even on economic policy. Philippe Lambert, thank you very much for your time. My pleasure. We've come all the way up to the north coast here in Belgium now. If you go round about 100 kilometres that way, you would hit England. Uh, we're here to meet a Walloon politician, Marc Tarabella. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. From the Belgian Socialist Party and, of course, the Socialist and Democrats group in the European Parliament. Perhaps a little bit of a disappearing species around Europe. Socialist parties not doing as well as they used to. I think that we have some difficulties because um, I point the behaviour of some prime minister uh, in the past as Tony Blair and Gerhard Schröder, the third way, was a wrong way because uh, they, uh, they abandoned uh, the ideals of, the, of a left-wing party. They uh, supported the flexi job, not well paid. Uh, and I think that uh, it's a contradiction with our, 
our ID that we have to defend as socialists. And we suffer from that. And we continue to suffer from that because uh, we are not perceived as an alternative. The Greens are predicted to do well in the upcoming elections. For the Socialist Party, for example, is it time to integrate more climate policy, to take the climate and environmental concerns more seriously? For several years, we are very uh, focusing on the eco-socialism. It means uh, socialism, left ideas, but in integrate in, with an integration of environmental criterion. Uh, and I think that is a necessity for a, a better future. There are some who say that uh, the existence of a separate Green Party and Socialist Party that's moving in a more green direction is actually just splitting the vote. Can you see a point where Greens and Socialists might come together? My favourite politician was French, Michel Rocard. 30 years ago proposed a big bank. Uh, and uh, it means that uh, some uh, people from several parties sharing the same opinion on the evolution of society has to work together and better. And I think that we have to do that now uh, into the European Union. Well, we will return to Brussels just for the moment. We'll look at a report together from Alix Le Bourdon. She's been looking into the issue of lobbies. Some say they're too powerful. There's been a bit of a battle recently in Brussels. Check out her report. Lobbyist and MEP, both integral cogs in the EU's machinery. Françoise Grostet is a French member of the European Parliament, representing MEP's views on laws to do with medication. Today, the lobbyist is representing a charity that helps child cancer patients. This is an uncontroversial meeting about a subject that has wide support. But MEPs like Francoise often face suspicion over their meetings with lobbyists, such as when it's with a representative of one of the big pharmaceutical companies. For lobbying to be acceptable and accepted, it's important to meet with everyone. That's because MEPs need to have as broad and an objective a view as possible. And afterwards, we close the door and we write the laws. Stéphane de Sellas has headed his Brussels lobbying firm for 15 years. 10% of his work is for charitable causes, like today, for no fee. Sometimes he meets with Françoise Grosset on behalf of corporate clients, such as health insurance companies. He says even lobbyists have to avoid conflicts of interest. We don't work for pharmaceutical laboratories. We couldn't work pro bono for these charitable causes and also for a company whose aims were diametrically opposed. Lobbying in Brussels has a murky reputation. Up till now, the only guidelines were the EU's Transparency Register, a list of 11,000 interest groups representing 80,000 people and causes. In the name of transparency, the European Parliament voted in January to register all meetings between MEPs and lobbyists, a change that had already been adopted by Europe's Greens group, the move initiated by the German MEP, Julia Reda. I think there are a lot of misguided fears about what this rule will mean. For example, one argument that I have heard often is that, oh, I will not be able to talk to people in the elevator anymore. And this is, of course, not the case. Uh, the rule means that scheduled meetings that you agree in advance have to be registered. A big step, but not full transparency. The rule only applies to the rapporteur, who present draft laws to Parliament, not MEPs at large. Mark Taravella, coming back to you, uh, trust in institutions in Europe, uh, can it be turned around? A lot of people think, look, these people who work in Europe, they're just on a gravy train, they're influenced by the lobbyists. It's not the true. I think that uh, to meet uh, the, the lobbyists, uh, take part of a job, uh, I think that uh, they are source of information. And I think that uh, when we are, you are a rapporteur, as I, it was my case in the Public Procurement Directive, I received 120 organisms who wanted to meet me. I met them, all of them, mm. half an hour, not more, to listen what they had to say. And I think that it was a source of information for me. Not more, not less. But just to talk about where we are right now, Flanders, as I said, you're a Walloon politician. So the question is, are you at home here in Flanders or is this a foreign country to you? Oh, we are at home. I am at home because it's Belgium, the Kingdom of Belgium. We have two economies very linked because each region is the first economical partner of the other. 
Well, it is true, isn't it, that there has been a rise in support for Flemish nationalism. There have been credible bids elsewhere in Europe for separatism. Scotland, Catalonia. Do you think your country could actually split? It's a possibility because uh, the nationalist voters are represented now 30%. And when we add the extreme right voters, maybe 10% more, it means 40 But uh, I, I think that in the past we found already uh, always the, the best solution to each problem. And for example, the federalism with the, exist, the existence and the creation of the region, Wallonia, Brussels and uh, Flanders, were created. And uh, we, we had the transfer of many matters to the region. And it was a response to the, the, the wish to be more, not separatism, but to be more independent. And I think that uh, in the future, maybe we can find those solutions. But we have to fear uh, separatism because uh, we are not uh, alone as country uh, living uh, some threat as uh, uh, separatism. I think that uh, Catalonia in Spain is, uh, of course, in the actuality. And, uh, but, but I fear that because we are, each of us, uh, Wallonia and Flanders, we are the first economic partner of the other. And I think that we have to maintain that in the interest of people. Well, we will be going into that a bit more later in our programme. But for now, thanks very much, Mark Tarabella. Many thanks to you. Indeed, I hope you'll join us for our exploration of Flanders. It's the smaller, slightly wealthier, Dutch-speaking part of Belgium with a bigger population. Hope to see you there in part two.